Good morning, everyone. It was a little loud. <laughs> well, we hope, I know there's still some more people coming into the room, but we have an awful lot of ground to cover and a fairly short time given the, the ground to cover. So I think we'll just get started here now. Um, I'm going to do a quick introduction of the individuals um, up here with me. And then we'll have some introductory comments, and then we'll come back and discuss the logistics of the, of the remaining session. So on my far left is Dr. Daniela Brunstrup, who's with the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. And of course, um, Germany is the host country this year, and Daniela is the honorary host country co-chair. Thank you very much, Lynn, and uh, good morning to everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, a very warm welcome from the host country to Berlin. We are very glad to have you all here. We are really impressed by the participation and we are, we are very honored to be the host country of the IHF 2019. You know that Germany is a strong supporter of the multi-stakeholder approach and we made quite an effort to also reach out to all those stakeholders who have been underrepresented so far. The German government fully supports also the work of the high-level panel on digital cooperation. And on behalf of the German government, I would like to thank you all for your commitment and support in the follow-up process to the final report of the high-level panel. I assume you would not be here today if you were not deeply committed to the future of internet governance. Since the final report was published in June. We have witnessed an incomparable consultation process within the internet governance community. Feedback has been received from all stakeholder groups, from government, civil society, private sector, academia, technical networks, and international organizations. They all were actively engaged in the past months. There has been an online consultation in the run-up of this main session and a very good synopsis is online, of, so you can see the results already online. Others have also contributed to this common effort, and I wanted to mention the online consultation by Eurodig, the results of which will be presented at lunchtime on the 28th of November. And today, on day one of the Internet Governance Forum 2019, we expect now further valuable, valuable contributions and comments from you. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion we will have right now. Germany has been commissioned by the United Nations to coordinate the process resulting from recommendation five as a so-called champion. Our partner country will be the UAE. Let me assure you, we are aware of the great responsibility this entails. During the next months, we want to bring a broad variety of voices to roundtables. The aim is to reach out to all stakeholder groups. Their experiences, their expertise, their ideas are extremely, extremely valuable for the roundtable's work. Because only by having everybody on board, we can create a truly global and inclusive dialogue. We will discuss in concrete terms what the architecture of international internet governance should look like. How can recommendation five be implemented? What should it be like in detail? And we really hope that we will find concrete solutions for these, to these questions. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite everybody and all of you to participate in this discussion and consultation program. Uh, just come up to us and um, take part in that dialogue. I'm looking forward now very much to our discussion today. A warm welcome again, and thank you all. Thank, thank you, Daniela. I think I'll go through the rest of the introductions here on the panel, and then we're going to have some remarks from USG Hotschild. So um, USG Fabrizio Hochstein Drummond is the special advisor on the preparations for the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. And he's also going to continue supporting the Secretary General on issues related to frontier technologies to ensure the follow-up to the high-level panel on digital cooperation, which he has been engaged in since its very earliest days. And he will share um, some of the status of that work to date in just a, just a few minutes. 
Um, we also have Ambassador Benedicto Fonseca, who is well known to many of you as he's been active in, in these WSIS and Internet Governance discussions for some years. Um, Benedicto is not here representing the government of Brazil, as he has a new portfolio, um, but he's here given his history and also his past chairmanship of the CSTD Working Group on Enhanced Cooperation. So he brings a wealth of knowledge of these, of these activities. And I'm Lynn Sainamore, Chair of the Internet Governance Forum, multi-stakeholder advisory group. Um, so I'm going to ask for, um, USG Huckschild to go to the podium in, in just a few minutes for his remarks. But maybe while there are some people still settling in, we'll just explain a little bit the setup here. Um, this was a process we ran in 2015 for the WISIS Plus 10 consultation, where um, we asked people to sit in your stakeholder groups. You are, of course, free to sit wherever you'd like but to sit in your stakeholder groups to get some easy access to the mics. What that allowed us to do was to rotate the discussions across the stakeholder groups. So we will go from one to the other. Um, and of course we have online participation as well, which will be rotated in as a fifth um, stakeholder group. So again, because I've had a few comments on the way in here, people are free to sit wherever you'd like, but if you take the mic, please take it according to your stakeholder group. It just allows for a, a, a nice kind of breadth of responses on the, on the subjects under discussion. And of course, when you take the mic, if you can just quickly identify yourself as well. And um, so people can start preparing. We are going to try and hold everybody to a firm max two and a half minutes per comment. Um, this session will end at 12.30. Um, we have a hard stop at to, at uh, 12.30 to get ready for the subsequent high-level sessions that are in here, and we want to maximize the time we actually have for comments from the, from the community. So we'll go through the, um, the actual logistics in a bit more detail in a few minutes, but just now I'd like to give the floor to USG Hawkschild. Uh, a very good morning to you all. It's great to be together in this uh, cozy little room. Uh, ich möchte an erster Stelle unser Gastgeber Deutschland bedanken. Uh, es ist wirklich um, ganz toll, wie das alles organisiert worden ist und wie breit um, und weitläufig die, die Einladungen waren. Um, I'm honored to be moderating the, the discussion, um, and I, but I'm also honored to be on the stage with Lynn, who I think has done four years of extraordinary work, voluntary work, it should be said, in leading the MAC, and she will be sorely missed. As Lynn highlighted, <laughs> as Lynn highlighted, we hope very much to take maximum advantage of this, I think, the largest IGF to date, to gather feedback on the Secretary General's high-level report on digital cooperation. The aim of the report is really very much aligned with the aims of the IGF, and that is to strengthen cooperation in the digital space among relevant actors, including governments, the private sector, civil society, academia, and international corporations. Of course, that cooperation has long existed and existed in many fora apart from the IGF. I think the Secretary General called the panel because he felt what was happening was really not to scale with the dimension of the challenge. International cooperation, he believes, is absolutely critical to ensure the benefits of the internet and other digital manifestations of digital technology are maximally distributed and the risks mitigated. So cooperation, international cooperation, is a safeguard to ensure the interoperability and access of digital technologies across all geographies. 3.6 billion people still do not have access to the internet. But as more and more people come online, we see the increased need for guardrails and security measures for personal data privacy, which balances considerations of freedom of expression, personal privacy, data ownership, and social cohesion. 
Most of the work, of course, depends on national and regional normative frameworks and policy approaches. But these technologies, by their very nature, ignore borders, by their very nature, are transnational. And I think everybody at this forum would aspire to maintaining or achieving the global nature of the internet. So in order to be truly effective and in order to minimize vulnerabilities, national and regional normative efforts need to be complemented by action at an international level. A fractured internet is a serious threat to open, free, safe, and just internet that was envisioned by its founding fathers. In September, it was striking that in separate declarations, the Secretary General, Eric Schmidt, the former Google chief executive and Alphabet chairman, and to some extent Brad Smith in a new book, all pointed towards the imminent fracturing of the internet into at least two parts, one led by China and another linked to the United States. We already see the fracturing of normative frameworks. Europe, America, China, Russia, and other countries around the world are generating different, at times, incompatible sets of rules and regulations and norms. In addition, there's a trend towards ensuring that the physical location of data is confined to data centers within the boundaries of countries with data localization laws. We cannot afford the dangers of incompatible, fragmented digital regulation. What it would mean is losing the free, secure, and global nature of the internet, and the ability, above all, to provide adequate guard rates for all, in particular, the most vulnerable. And as wonderful and indisputable and now indispensable as all the benefits of in digital technologies undoubtedly are, and without lapsing into sort of dystopian Luddite negativity around new technologies, we have to get better at acknowledging seriously the harms and addressing them less in a defensive manner than in a constructive manner that really tries to maximize the benefits in an open-eyed manner. Let me just give one example where there is international consensus. Online child abuse. According to a September article of the New York Times, which appeared very well researched, in the UN were obviously not in a position to independently verify what it set out, but according to that article, the number of reports of child abuse imagery on the internet have radically increased over the past two decades and increased much more rapidly than the growth of the internet itself. In 1998, there were 3,000 reports of child abuse images on the internet, according to that article. And last year, internet companies reported 45 million online photographs and videos of an abusive nature of children, double, if I'm not mistaken, the figure of the previous year. And that is an area where there is consensus across borders, consensus across stakeholder groups of the need for better control. And for me, it's an indication of just how far we're falling short in having the adequate security guard roles for the most vulnerable. And that's particularly true at an international level. Our international cooperation mechanisms have not yet developed to the required sophistication to attend to these growing challenges. International cooperation in this domain is very much in its infancy. Governance, 
oversight in this space is difficult. Obviously, we acknowledge that. And legislation tends to lag far behind innovation. In addition, in a, we have now a climate of increased nationalism and isolationism, and cooperation at an international level is waning at the very moment where it is most needed, not only to tackle the potentially disruptive effects of new digital technologies, but to come to grips with other pressing priorities like climate change. It's also necessary that we address better the large geographic discrepancies in the challenges and the opportunities that digital technology begins, and especially that we make greater efforts to incorporate the perspectives of the Global South. I think in the 28 or so EU countries, connectivity rates are around 90%. In the 47 least developed countries in the world, countries that stand to gain or lose the most by connectivity, connectivity rates are under 20 percent. That's more than a fourfold difference. The price of access, centralization of data, and infrastructure acquired by digital systems is likely to foster, if we follow current trends, increased monopolization of data mature economies and increased dependency of developing countries. And yet, actors influencing the standards and regulatory discourse, many in this room, are mostly from the more affluent countries, despite the global south having the most to gain and the most to lose from new technologies. I have to acknowledge here that Germany has made an extraordinary effort to make sure that this IGF really brings people from all over the world and goes beyond the countries that traditionally dominate its participation. And we hope that future hosts will also be able to do this. It's very welcome. We also have to continue, and I know the IGF has made important strides forward in this regard, but I don't think we can content ourselves with what's been achieved so far, we have to continue to try and push for greater participation of women uh, and, other vo and other groups who traditionally are not adequately heard in the tech debate. The main session is an important opportunity for different stakeholder and geographic groups to share their feedback and perspectives on the high-level panel report on digital cooperation and in particular, the recommendations 5A and B on global digital cooperation. These recommendations state that, and I quote, that the Secretary General should facilitate an agile and open consultation process to develop updated mechanisms for global digital cooperation. We suggest an initial goal of marking the UN 75th anniversary in 2020 with a global commitment for digital cooperation and the report contains a proposed text, to enshrine shared values, principles, understandings, and objectives for improved global digital cooperation architecture. As part of this process, we understand that the UN Secretary General may appoint a technology envoy. The report then goes on to outline three possible architectures for digital cooperation. First is the Internet Governance Plus Forum, which enhances and extends this multi-stakeholder IGF and tries to suggest an architecture with an advisory group, a cooperation accelerator, policy incubator, an observatory and help desk that would drive it towards more concrete results and better um, policy support to those who may need it. The second is a so-called distributed co-governance architecture, which would build on existing mechanisms and relies on self-forming horizontal distributed network approach used by the Internet Engineering Task Force, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, i.e. ICANN, the World Wide Web Consortium, the regional internet registries, the I 
IEEE and others to host networks to design norms and policies. So a completely distributed, um, self-motivated um, uh, um, form of the formulation of norms and policies. And the third option put forward by the report is the so-called digital commons architecture, which envisions a commons approach with loose coordination by the UN. It takes the example from the areas of space, climate change, and the sea, where the international community has entered into treaties and developed principles, norms, and functional cooperation mechanisms to designate certain spaces as international commons and then govern them through ongoing practice, dialogue, and within a global normative framework. To give some insight to the existing discussion around recommendations 5A and B and digital cooperation, I want to, we um, solicited views from about 500 stakeholders, member states, the private sector, um, civil society. We got very substantive feedback, written feedback from over 100 um, entities. What was clear there is that um, when it comes to governance frameworks, there is some controversy with uh, some fearing uh, any international frameworks that could be perceived as intrusive on what, on a, a sort of more libertarian, um, free market, uh, ungoverned ethic uh, of the internet uh, that many would wish to see uh, upheld. Um, other groups um, would like to see more of an internationalizing of their own approach with a healthy degree of regulation, uh, and in particular when it comes to the safeguarding of data. Um, at the same time, others are concerned about the intrusion of international politics um, into um, uh, regulation, and in particular, in the current atmosphere of extreme distrust, there is a lot of skepticism uh, about the ability to achieve um, international frameworks, and a lot of doubt about those, um, the goodwill or the good faith um, effort behind uh, of those who wish to pursue it. Um, I think behind these rather mixed uh, um, voices, or voices that I would say tend towards fairly minimalist um, levels of ambition, is, is a sense of multilateralism fatigue uh, in light of current geopolitical divisions, um, where even the smaller entities who have the most to gain from the protection of international normative frameworks um, balance the pursuit of those against the threat of pushback by one of the larger uh, powers, and hence uh, tend to want to keep their heads down in times of strife and dispute. So I think if we want to make progress, and if we all agree here that putting the international safeguards in place to try and uphold and promote a universal, global, safe and free internet. If we think that's worthwhile, it's going to take a concerted effort by all our respective um, entities. I think um, if we just let things drift as they're going now, the predictions both of the Secretary General as well as some very seasoned and senior tech executives are likely to be realized. And in many of the debates I've had with member states in particular, I always found what is a little strange is that the trend is not to compare the cost of action against the cost of inaction, but the cost of action against the desirability of the ideal. And of course, if we weigh what can be achieved through international negotiation and discussion and compromise against some sense of national or regional ideals, 
What comes out of a negotiated deal will always be less. But I think the truly meaningful comparison is not with the ideal, but with the cost we'll pay and future generations will pay by doing nothing. So I hope we can use this fora to map out ways and to develop a will to see how we can strengthen international uh, architecture. And of course, implementation or developing of recommendation 5A and B um, on their own uh, are, are just a very minor uh, grain in the sand con to contribute towards the construction uh, of that uh, architecture. But having said that, um, I think they are an important contribution. And we believe the combination uh, with the UN 75 effort, which the Secretary General wants to mark by the world taking the temperature of where it's heading and looking open-eyed at the challenges that we're drifting towards and reflecting on how international cooperation can be better revived to address those challenges. I think that UN 75 moment and reflection process is very timely to be combined with an effort to revitalize efforts around uh, succeeding in upholding uh, free, safe, and secure global internet. So we, I very much look forward to hearing your comments now on um, these recommendations, and we will do our utmost um, to adjust uh, the recommendations or to pursue their implementation in line uh, with the comments uh, we get. So thank you again for the time, and nochmals danke an Deutschland, das uh, es möglich gemacht zu haben, dass wir alle hier sein könnten. Thank you. If we could just ask the AV to put the two slides up on the screen. Um, one of them is the timetable we're working towards here today, and the other one is a framing document um, to cover specifically the points that USG Huckschild just spoke to. So that's up there now. Uh, Ambassador um, Benedicto is going to moderate the first session, which is general comments. Um, again, this session is focused on the HLPDC report, specifically some of the possible architectures of, of um, cooperation and recommendation 5A and 5B. And what, as a panel, we had agreed was a reasonable approach is up there with 30 minutes for general comments um, on the report or specifically on these um, individual sections. And then we would intend to move through the possible architectures and the recommendations with a little more channeling, if you will, um, in the main section there for the 80 minutes or so. Again, um, if people could take the mics according to your stakeholder group. Again, you're free to sit wherever you want, but it does allow us to be equal across all the stakeholder groups. And for those of us that are here on the panel, looking at this um, graphic in front of us, it is, of course, reversed because it shows the stage behind us. So governments are over there, private sector here, civil society there, and technical community on the, on the left. Uh, Ambassador? Thank you, uh, Lynn. Well, I'd like to, to start by thanking Mr. Hochschild for setting the scene for our discussion today. Uh, actually, I should start by uh, thanking the, for the opportunity of being here today as uh, my friend and colleague Lynn Santamu has already said, I'm not here on an official capacity as the representative of Brazil since uh, as a diplomat I have moved on and I'm now uh, based in Boston. Uh, but I was deeply honored uh, to have been invited to be here. So thank you very much, uh, Lynn, and the organizing uh, committee. Uh, and I hope to be able to, to contribute uh, with uh, the experience I have accumulated over those years working with uh, internet governance uh, related issues in, at the IGF, but also in so many other fora. Uh, 
you have mentioned that I chair the working group on uh, enhanced cooperation, the second, uh, the, the second configuration of that group, uh, which we fondly call the uh, CSD enhanced cooperation 2.0. <laughs> Uh, I think when we named it, we expected to, to achieve some success. Uh, but uh, maybe you should not name 2.0, but rather 1B, so because we, the, the outcomes was basically the same as the first uh, configuration that was chaired by my friend and colleague uh, 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 from Hungary, uh, Peter Major. So uh, thank you again, Lynn, and uh, let me take this opportunity also to congratulate Henriette uh, Esther for her appointment as the, the next uh, MAG chair for next year. Uh, congratulations, Henriette, you have been uh, a force behind those meetings and so many other internet governance discussions. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you do a great job uh, follow you on the steps of Lynn, uh, so you have big shoes to fill in, but I, I know you'll be up to the challenge. So having said that, uh, and uh, also coming back to what Lynn has said, we want to make a very good use of our time. Uh, starting from now, we would like to invite you to make interventions, uh, and we want to follow uh, something that was uh, indeed uh, I don't know if it was inaugurated, but we did at Net Mundial that was to uh, separate uh, the uh, stakeholder groups by lines and uh, assign a microphone for each stakeholder so we can uh, uh, move and we can rotate among groups and so we can have as much input as we can from different uh, angles. Uh, uh, we'll try to do it uh, to the extent possible to get as many uh, inputs uh, we can. So uh, for this first uh, session, for this first part of our session, uh, if I understood correctly, <laughs> seeing from here, governments will be there, but I understand. There. So I would invite government representatives if uh, anyone wants to make. Uh, initially, uh, that part would allow for general comments. We are not focusing on the particular recommendations. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to maybe have some uh, broader uh, uh, encompassing remark that uh, in regard to internet governance in general or in regard to the high level uh, panel on digital cooperation uh, in general. And then we move to the uh, actual uh, uh, recommendations that have a direct interest to our discussions here. So for this first, I'd like to invite governments. Uh, so my fellow government uh, colleagues, do not be shy. Take here the, uh, the first microphone on my far right is available for you. And then we'll have a uh, private sector also, this sec on my uh, right, on your left, uh, and on the other side of the aisle, civil society, and on the far left, uh, technical community. So uh, I will be taking the interventions as they appear. I, as I can see, the first one was the lady over there, so she's from civil society. You have the floor, madam. And one thing I'd like just to recall, uh, we want to invite you to make interventions to be very focused, uh, to be very concrete in regard to the recommendations. Uh, I know sometimes there's a temptation to say things we have been doing and the experiences we had before. Uh, we have all due respect, it's not, uh, we would lose a lot of time if we allow this to take place, so we'll be very strict from the chairmanship not to allow those kind of interventions. We want very uh, action-oriented and very focused uh, interventions, and if you can restrict it to two minutes or two and a half minutes maximum, we would really appreciate it. Madam, you have the floor. Hello, I'm Meilin Fang. Can you hear me? Yes. You Hello, I'm Meilin Fung. Um, I'm with the People Centered Internet, and I co-founded it with Vince Cerf, one of the fathers of the internet. But I'm here to speak on behalf of a voice that is not here, who is Douglas Engelbart. 
he was with the, the two nodes, the first two nodes of the internet. He would be thrilled to know about this digital cooperation. He spent his life until he passed away in 2013 talking about the opportunities for networks of communities to come together. I think digital cooperation can really realize the original founding genesis of the internet in that way. And so I just wanted to say that history is with us. The founding ideas of the internet were about coming together in digital cooperation. And one way that he saw that we could do this is by common protocols, by having networks of communities working together by doing it in a systematic way. So socio-technical protocols I see as the next era of digital cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Uh, may I turn to Thomas Schneider, Switzerland government. Thank you, Benedicto. Oh, echo is always nice. Um, Thanks to everybody uh, for, for the presentation of the high-level panel's report and, and its findings, in particular the, the proposed proposals for the architecture. As you may know, Switzerland has been uh, very much supporting the setup of the high-level panel and also its, its work, because we think that this is uh, one way, hopefully, to de-block some of the uh, disagreements on, on a number of issues regarding to the future of the uh, governance architecture. In our view, the report and its recommendations <clears throat> are really a source of inspiration that may guide us in agreeing on next steps with regard to how to further develop uh, a global digital cooperation and also governance uh, system. And what is important for us is that it identifies some of the key gaps of the current uh, architectures uh, one, of course, and, and, and I think the first step is to see to what extent we agree on the findings of the report regarding these gaps. One is, of course, the inclusiveness of the processes, a support for stakeholders, not only governments, but all stakeholders from smaller and developing countries. The other one is a disconnect between expert dialogues, like many of them which happen here at the IGF, and the decision makers who do not necessarily see the whole picture when they take a decision in a silo. So this is for us one of the key findings. And then as a consequence of this, uh, identifying this disconnect across silo cooperation and interdependent interdisciplinary uh, thematic cooperation in agile forms. So for us, the next step would then to see to what extent we agree on functions that need to be improved in order to uh, have a better uh, digital governance and cooperation. Of course, one of these functions is to achieve a holistic picture where we can all together in a truly inclusive uh, multi-stakeholder uh, dialogue like the IGF, but even broader, to coordinate, to see that we understand the issues, that we can start identifying solutions. Then. The next step would be to build thematic, agile, inclusive policy networks that would deal with the, with the uh, uh, issues. And then, of course, to install some kind of support and help desk functions. Now, with regard, and I'll finish with this, with regard to the free options that are proposed in Recommendation 5, they basically... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, we are coming to that later on, yeah. not now. Okay, all right. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, so, I will thank you, Thomas. I will turn now to the gentleman uh, uh, in the front uh, aisle. I understand you are from civil society. Uh, no? You can go ahead. Please identify yourself and make your intervention, please. Uh, thank you and good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Campling. Uh, I am a director of uh, 419 Consulting, which is a public affairs and public policy consultancy, uh, so very much in the private sector. Um, just reflecting on the opening comments, which were, uh, I think, uh, really excellent, uh, you might be surprised that there isn't, in fact, a consensus um, in the need to block um, uh, content such as uh, child sexual abuse uh, material across all parts of the uh, community. Um, I, I was at uh, the IETF conference in Singapore last week, 
Um, and uh, actually any efforts to block content would be regarded amongst certain parts of the tech community as hugely contentious, even if there's an underlying good behind the required blocking. Um, so things like malware, child sex abuse material, um, uh, and in fact, some of the new standards that are coming out of the IETF would actually arguably, as an unintended uh, consequence of those standards, aid the dissemination uh, of such undesirable content, um, uh, yeah, be it malware, child sexual abuse, or, or other such uh, materials, as well as um, enhancing the opportunity to centralise uh, the internet, making it even easier for the large tech companies to uh, uh, exploit e even more data monetization uh, opportunities. Um, and I think part of the problem is that there is virtually no involvement in fora such as the IETF by policymakers. Um, so therefore you have people with, what in my view, are fairly extreme views on libertarianism um, who are not uh, prepared to consider uh, aspects such as the need to block the dissemination of that content. Um, so it needs people like the people gathered here uh, to engage at those events. So please, any policymakers, please go to the IETF. The next one's in Vancouver um, early next year. Your voices are needed uh, to give a different perspective to the voices of the technologists, which are pu pushing a pure play libertarianism view. Can you um, conclude your remarks, please? Yes, uh, and I think if that engagement doesn't happen, uh, it will accelerate the uh, sort of splinter net uh, because people will, will insist on, on um, that migration to protect themselves from that harmful content. Thank you. Uh, I will turn now to uh, my colleague, Mark Carvel. I used to see you as representative of UK, but I, I assume you have moved on as well. So you, you have the floor, sir. Yes, in, yes indeed. Uh, thank you, Benedicto. I, a year ago, I would have been over on that side of the house, but I, I've left now uh, service in the UK government. Um, I'm working uh, to assist EURIDIG, the European Dialogue and Internet Governance. And uh, as Lynn uh, trailed earlier on, we'll be presenting the results of our consultation on the high-level panel's report on Thursday at 12.30. I don't have a room number yet, but when we have that room, we'll, we'll announce it. So I, I just wanted to um, uh, trail that as an important process of consultation with stakeholders that the European uh, IGF undertook. Indeed, uh, if you want to have a look at uh, the report in a physical form, it's a synthesis of the stakeholders' uh, responses. It included a number of European governments, uh, a number of uh, European institutions, Council of Europe, European Commission, European Broadcasting Union, and uh, civil society representatives and individuals, and we had some private sector comment. If you want to look at it, this report is available in physical form uh, in, in the village on the UADIG uh, uh, stand, and you can access it online, of course, at uadig.org. I, I will just say very briefly, without going into any detail at this stage, that European stakeholders who responded were very supportive of this process, and we appreciate uh, very much your comments, uh, Mr. Hofschild, in, in, in explaining the context, which there was a lot of sympathy with the objectives, and uh, I guess one of the key elements that really came through in the responses uh, uh, from European stakeholders was support for building on existing global multi-stakeholder solutions and mechanisms with the aim of maximizing the contributions of digital technologies to sustainable development while also protecting human rights, data, uh, data free flow of data, which you touched on, uh, uh, privacy and freedom of expression online. So there was a lot of uh, support for the general thrust of the panel's uh, report in, in not going down a tricky route of creating new processes, new mechanisms that would risk duplication and complicating the scene, but there was ready recognition that existing mechanisms need to sort of 
ramp up and meet the challenges. So again, that's a very uh, important point that resonated well with the stakeholders who responded. Um, just a couple of points about omissions. There was a sense that the report did not really engage on climate change and environmental issues. That was spotted by several respondents as a, as a serious uh, omission. And maybe as the sort of way forward uh, rolls out for implementing uh, recommendations, that can be really factored in. And also the role of media. The European Broadcasting Union made a very strong point that there was not enough uh, relevance uh, of, of uh, the role of media in this whole, whole area. So uh, generally support very much what the UN is doing. The proposal to create a, a tech envoy post is very much uh, welcomed. Many of us, like me, who have been you know, involved in this area for some time, recall the very effective uh, special advisor for the IGF uh, and for internet governance, uh, Nitin Desai, who was a very important uh, uh, appointment within the UN system. And, and we want to, uh, European stakeholders would, would like to see uh, that coming back to that kind of appointment to really pull together, marshal the effort across the UN system while engaging with the multi stakeholder processes. So, uh, stakeholders in Europe look, very, look forward very much to working uh, on the next steps, working with the UN system, working with all the stakeholder colleagues and uh, mm -hmm. taking forward the implementation. And we will comment on the specific recommendations mm -hmm. later, later in this session, but also uh, on Thursday at 12.30. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for your remarks. You will have noticed I allowed some more time for Mark because I think he was reporting on a regional process and I think it was uh, very helpful for for us, but I would really encourage all uh, speakers to try to stick to the time uh, to be allotted, and I will uh, do my best not to to be very blunt about it, but if needed, uh, I, I just try to make sure our time, we have efficient use of our time. Let me now turn to my dear colleague and friend, uh, Juan Fernandez from Cuba. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Benedicto. Uh, my comments regarding the IGF Plus, I place it in the website of, of, the, of the IGF, so I will not refer them here in order to save time. I'm going to refer to something more general. We are talking about digital cooperation, so I want to c focus in the concept of cooperation itself. The dictionary says that cooperation is to work together with another or others to achieve a common goal. Therefore, there cannot be cooperation if there's no common goal to which all, all parties can aspire. It may seem that this is a very obvious uh, conclusion. However, history teaches us that many attempts at cooperation has been frustrated because some of the parties are satisfied with the status quo and do not recognize those that are problems for other parties. Therefore, the, the, the starting point for any cooperation must be the identification of the objective to be achieved. And this identification should be made at two levels. First, at the highest level and political level, all parties must agree in the overall objective to be achieved. An excellent example of this is the classic first paragraph of the Declaration of Principles of the Geneva Phase of the World Summit on the Information Society. And the, in addition to agreeing in an overall and political high-level objective, there should be other uh, objectives that have to be identified at a more particular and technical level, and then to figure out how to operationalize that. That is my uh, contribution now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan. Uh, I will turn now to the lady in the main uh, aisle, uh, 
you, please, uh, you have the floor. Can you identify yourself and the organization you belong to? Okay. Um, I will speak French because I'm French. Je m'appelle Muriel Alapini, je viens du Bénin et je suis membre de l'association FGI Bénin. Um, cette année, pendant l'école africaine de la gouvernance d'Internet organisée par euh, APC, nous avons eu à travailler justement sur ces recommandations-là euh, par rapport à ce rapport. Ma question est celle-ci. Quand on prend en compte le contexte africain, où le précédent modèle d'installation de la gouvernance d'Internet euh, n'est pas totalement encore mise en place dans tous les pays, pensez-vous que nous avons besoin actuellement d'un nouveau modèle encore si le précédent n'a pas fini de faire ses preuves Merci. Euh, merci bien de votre intervention. Euh, je vous remercie. Uh, now I give the floor to the lady on my left. Uh, could you please identify yourself? And, yes. Ah, it's a gentleman. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You, you, I'm sorry, sir. It's, you have the floor. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, this is uh, ASM Bozlu Rahman. I come from Bangladesh Internet Governance Forum and a member of the Asia Pacific Internet Governance Forum. My intervention is. I would like to endorse uh, this report and I would like to congratulate for publishing this report to the public domain. My specific uh, intervention is uh, where is the action plan? How this report will connect country level? Uh, this is my one, in one question. Second question is how this report will contribute to shaping the future of media, entertainment, and information sector uh, in future. So this is my uh, two questions uh, to, uh, to this uh, panel. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think actually the points you raised are in a way embedded in the discussions. I hope uh, some of the contributions will focus on, on those points. Uh, I'll turn to the last two speakers on this, and I'm closing the list after those two speakers and turning to, to uh, Lynn to, to, for the other part of this uh, meeting, which will focus more clearly on... Uh, yes, I will allow also uh, Raul Echeverri, of course, so, but after that, and, uh, and also my uh, fellow compatriot, and then I, I will close the list after those four. Uh, participation. So you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Ambassador. My name is uh, Vincent Gouillard from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of France, speaking on behalf of uh, Ambassador for Digital Affairs, uh, Henri Verdier. Uh, I shall speak in French. Nous voudrions avant tout remercier les Nations Unies pour leurs efforts et féliciter les pays sélectionnés pour diriger les travaux à venir sur les recommandations du rapport du panel de haut niveau du secrétaire général. Ce travail est ambitieux, les prémices, les bases qui ont été posées nous semblent excellentes et ce travail est absolument nécessaire. Cependant, comme un certain nombre de gouvernements, nous regrettons que la suite des travaux ait été lancée ces dernières semaines derrière un voile d'obscurité, voire de secret. Nous avons reçu très peu d'informations sur les critères de sélection des champions et ne savons même pas si nous pouvons faire partie d'autant de groupes de travail que nous le souhaitons ou si notre participation doit être limitée. La France, enfin, l'objectif de mon intervention n'est pas de demander le leadership d'un groupe de travail sur la France ou sur une recommandation, mais la France, comme vous le savez, déploie une grande activité sur les questions numériques, comme l'a montré l'IGF 2018. Nous aurions apprécié être informés directement de la suite des travaux sur le rapport, plutôt que d'en entendre parler par hasard comme cela s'est fait. Mais l'important, ce n'est pas les sentiments de la France, ce n'est pas le sentiment des États en tant que partie prenante, c'est, à notre sens, de conserver l'excellente réputation de ce rapport et la forte dynamique qu'il a lancée. Pour y parvenir, nous pensons que nous devons travailler dans la transparence et la confiance. Or, la confiance, malheureusement, est une ressource de plus en plus rare sur Internet, 
Nous devons la renforcer, nous devons la restaurer. C'est l'un des buts du rapport du panel de haut niveau. Et pour cela, nous pensons que nous devons être exemplaires, faire preuve de transparence et de confiance les uns dans les autres. Je vous remercie. Merci bien de votre intervention. Et je dois dire que je pense que cette session, je pense qu'un des objectifs est justement de donner l'opportunité aux représentants du secrétaire général d'expliquer le processus et de expliquer exactement comment cette session va s'insérer dans le processus qui a été lancé. C'est ma, ma compréhension de ce qui se passe ici. Mais on va avoir l'opportunité d'écouter le secrétariat en du temps. Uh, I'll turn now to, uh, my, uh, to the gentleman in the main aisle. Can you please you have the floor? Can you identify yourself and the organization you belong to? Uh, thank you, Mr. Fonseca. I'm an independent consultant, Walter Nathries. And actually, at this point in time, we're doing something at the IGF, which is IGF+. Plus. And I'm not going to promote it, but I'll tell you what it can do in a couple of months' time. It's on the deployment of internet standards that would immediately make the world safer if industry would deploy them at this point in time. So that is happening, and I'll promote it for one second, Wednesday at one o'clock in room three. But what it can do in a few months' work is get recommendations, concept recommendations ready to present on at the IGF. So we'll not be having presentations, we'll have sessions working on actions. How can we actually make these recommendations happen? And from there, who do you need to involve? And from the recommendations, you will see that there are several stakeholder groups that are never represented at the IGF, but will have to be present if this deployment is to happen, so in education, in industry, etc. And I think that that is something which shows which an IGF Plus model could actually work, because it's always been my personal conviction is that we have all these brilliant minds in a room for four or five days and basically let them escape once the IGF is over and not use the potential to cooperate between all these silos. And the doors in these silos need to be opened to make complex internet issues actually to be solved. So thank you for this opportunity and hope to see you on Wednesday. Thank you uh, for your intervention. I will now give the floor to uh, my friend and colleague Raul Echeverria. Thank you, Ambassador Benedicto. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I, I would like to comment on the following. This, um, I already submitted my own comments uh, in the consultation process. Thank you very much for facilitating that process. Um, I, I think that we have to see the, the, the models that are proposed um, as not exclusive to each other. I think that the IGF uh, Plus is not just one option, it's a must. And so this is something that we have to do. But in the other two models, there are several pieces that are very, very interesting and could be complementary of the IGF Plus. So we should analyze uh, what are the pieces that can help to improve the, the general ecosystem. And uh, let me be very brief because uh, we are short of time. But the, so one important aspect is that when we created the, um, uh, the IGF in 2005, we created the IGF as the central piece of the in internet governance ecosystem. And we were able to do that at that time. But the, the status quo, I, and I, <laughs> I was thinking about what uh, my colleague Juan Fernandez said, because there is nothing that evolves as much as the status quo, because the status quo changes every minute in this field. So when we say that we, we want to, uh, to keep the status quo, it's something that we cannot keep because it's changing, evolving all the time. But the, so the, 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 the context has changed very much. And so the, there are now, there are several hundreds of forums, uh, small, medium, and large forums that of people, countries, and stakeholders that come together to discuss uh, several things. And so we cannot just offer this central piece of something. We, what we have to work very much is, is in, in, in the interconnection between all the pieces. And we have to see the IGF Plus not as the central piece of the ecosystem, but as the fundamental piece of the ecosystem. And this is why 
all the, uh, the there are proposals in the other models that are very complementary toward this objective is that to make the, the all the system work much more connected and much more informal of course there, there, there is a need of uh, a lot of resources to make it work and to offer help to all the stakeholders to become engaged in the appropriate place and the appropriate level and, the, and in a meaningful manner. Thank you. Thank you. I move immediately to Ms. Gato. Uh, Isaac, uh, yes, please, you have the floor. Obrigado, Embaixador Benedito. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, quickly, I'm Raquel Gato. I work with Internet Society. We've submitted uh, a contrib written contributions extensively on the report, both uh, before and shaping the report and after with the follow-up implementation. Uh, so I'm not going to, uh, to speak largely about it, uh, but invite everyone to, to, um, to read. Uh, quickly on three, top, uh, three comments that I wanted to make today. Uh, first of all, uh, we appreciate that the report recognized uh, that um, digital cooperation and mechanisms needs to be holistic, multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder, agile, and able to convert rhetorical into practice. That's what uh, the Internet Society uh, also believes, that the, the digital cooperation can be improved, the digital cooperation mechanism can be improved uh, and needs to be improved, but collaborative processes are still the best way when technology is concerned. The second point I want to make is also that uh, instead of creating new mechanisms, uh, we do believe that strengthening the IGF is the best way, uh, thus the IGF plus um, uh, suggestion, recommendation. Uh, and, sorry, uh, uh, sorry? Uh, we are going to address the, the specific recommendations, so now we just okay, want just to get some general, general comments. comments. Okay. Yes, yes, please. Uh, just one uh, concern regarding the discussions that will follow up is regarding uh, the coexistent or the ambiguity uh, coexistent between multi stakeholder and multilateral approaches. And in trying to do both, there is a risk where you are going to uh, make compromises and reasonable compromises that might uh, lead to more negotiated outcomes. Uh, and that's something that we should, as a community, address going forward. Um, the other um, suggestions is also to have uh, kind of a dispatch function for the IGF to be uh, delivering more tangible outcomes and uh, being more practical, as the, the report points out, where you would identify some of the issues, uh, who could follow up and where they would be uh, followed. And we have also a lot of examples to illustrate and draw from, including Net Mundial, including the IANA transition process, and so on. So thank you very much for your time, and I'm sorry to be the last one. I was slow walking. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Well, someone has to be the last one and I thank you all for participating let me just check if we have some remote participation where is the remote facilitator yes Anya is there someone from remote no so uh, with this we conclude that first part and then I turn to Lynn for the more I think more juicy part of our discussions today thank you Lynn. I'm not sure if it's juicy but we can certainly look at this first session as a warm-up and as we've stated in numerous communications, we're really looking for a concrete, substantive discussion here. So if you've submitted comments, it's really no need to stand up and give us a pressy or, or a summary of them. If you could speak directly to the things you think the community should be considering, or things that you think would be helpful, given the objectives we've outlined, that would be a good way to actually advance the, the discussion and ensure we were building towards some, some takeaways for the next step of this process. So in the next hour, we're going to focus on the um, slide that's up behind me, which talks about the models and then specifically in the center outlines the four major components the report talks about with respect to the IGF plus. And then of course, we also wanted to come to recommendations 5A and 5B, which were the suggested appointment of a tech envoy and uh, the IGF's secretariat being institutionally placed in the secretary general's office. Um, so the floor is open, um, really would encourage those that are participating um, online as well to please, we do have a process to allow you to get your voice and your comments in. Um, this is also a, a good opportunity to say that there is in fact a survey in the SCED app where you can put some additional comments and some additional suggestions, not just in this 
not just in this um, session, but for all of the sessions over the course of the week. And so, I mean, as, as Raul said there at the end, that while the bulk of the reports we've had through our process, through some of the regional processes, and even through the Secretary General's office process, um, there was an, a lot of support for the IGF Plus model. There were also some comments that talked about some of the other um, uh, common areas that might be interesting in the other two approaches as well. So, I mean, again, in IGF spirit, this is an open discussion. At the same time, um, we really would like to um, be able to make some concrete um, progress as we move forward here. So this session, uh, this section of this session was intended to focus on the IGF plus and specifically on those four components. And Ambassador Fonseca and I will, will share the moderating. I will probably do this IGF plus and Ambassador Fonseca will pick up the recommendation 5A and 5B. So with that, the mics are open. I've never actually seen such short mics in any IGF session, um, which, so we have some individuals coming forward. You have the floor. Please again introduce yourself and your stakeholder group. The mics are not necessarily the clearest alignment here. You have the floor. Thank you. My name is Finn Peterson from the Danish government. Uh, Denmark welcomes uh, the report of the uh, high-level panel and the strong focus on a multi-stakeholder approach to enhance digital cooperation. Uh, Denmark actively supports uh, multi-stakeholder processes and cooperation uh, in order to secure an open, uh, secure and free and trustworthy internet. Moreover, uh, Denmark believes uh, strongly in safeguarding the role of the IGF and other multi-stakeholder forums such as ICANN. We strongly uh, support the initiative to strengthen the IGF, the uh, PLUS model. Firstly, for us it's crucial to secure the uh, financial and support of the IGF secretariat. Uh, secondly, uh, we support uh, the moving of the responsibility for the IDF uh, to the office of the UN uh, General Secretary and appointing uh, a tech envoy. Uh, thirdly, we believe there is a need for more inclusive participation in the IDF, including business and governments, but also from the global south. Uh, fourthly, uh, fourthly, we, uh, uh, the ITF should uh, continue to be a forum uh, where new issues related to the internet can be raised and discussed through bottom-up process. Uh, fifth point, it is important to Denmark that the ITF continues to be a non-decision-making uh, forum. However, there is an urgent need uh, for more efficient way to work together to ensure a strengthened focus and more uh, actionable outcome. Uh, for example, developing best practices, having more discussions based on evidence, uh, and uh, establishing more coordinating approach to the agenda setting in order to focus on the most important issues. Uh, finally, uh, we must all work uh, closer together, break down uh, silos between uh, different communities uh, and continents, uh, and uh, in order to combat uh, fragmentation and to ensure that uh, the internet continues to be a common good for all. Denmark are looking forward to continue the dialogue with all stakeholders to develop an efficient uh, architecture for uh, uh, global uh, digital cooperation for an even stronger IGF, the IGF Plus model. Thank you very much. Thank you. And some of the work that we'll be doing, hopefully in this session, subsequent to this session, 
of course, we need to start putting the next level of definition to the things we all say we want and we like. So if we, for instance, like a tech envoy, at some point we're going to have to talk about the responsibilities of the tech envoy and where that fits in the overall process. So I really want to encourage people to start thinking about those next steps. To spend the next hour kind of restating our positions that have already been published is, is you know, not going to move us forward as quickly as I think um, many of us would like. So with that, Jorge, you have a challenge to give us something new to think about. Hello, Hello good morning, everyone. This is uh, Jorge Cancio from the Swiss Federal Office of Communications. And I will try to follow on on what uh, Ambassador Thomas Schneider already introduced before. Um, as you know, and as uh, Fabrizio Hochschild knows, we have been deeply involved in uh, the discussions uh, with the opportunity of uh, supporting our former president, Ms. Doris Leuthardt, within the panel. Um, the panel really proposes, at least in our eyes, um, uh, we could say uh, three flavors of the same ice cream, uh, because in the end, uh, what the panel is proposing in these architecture models is to respond to the gaps, to fill in the gaps we have been uh, identifying in the global internet governance and digital cooperation arrangements. And those gaps uh, were uh, mentioned before by Thomas. And the responses in the end, whatever the specific name in the three models is, is in the end to improve the follow-up to the discussions we are having in a global fora, especially in the IGF, which is the main global forum to have uh, digital policy discussions. So a follow-up to that. A coordination that allows us to bring the reaction to challenges that arrive as uh, the Paris call tried or the Christchurch call tried here into the structures of the IGF to have those discussion, discussions and those actions not outside the IGF but inside the IGF. And of course we need to uh, support and to help uh, all the stakeholder communities to find their way, find the way to the right stakeholders, find the, the way to the right processes and to the right information through a help desk and observatory function. So more coordination, better policy networks also to uh, come to results with that coordination and very strong uh, observatory and help desk function. And Switzerland really stands ready to help here and to su uh, support this process. We have been, uh, um, we launched in 2014 the Geneva Internet Platform, which tries to offer many of these tools as an observatory, as a support network for Geneva diplomats, but also diplomats in New York, diplomats in, in Brussels, and worldwide to any stakeholders interested in uh, digital policy, and we will continue on that. And uh, apologies for going over the time, but as there are no other people in the queue and you ask me for concrete proposals, we are willing to continue on that. And of course, we are also willing to help in continuing uh, consultations uh, hopefully also in Geneva, back to back to the IGF 2020 preparations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jorge. I see Tamea coming up to the mic, but let me just, in the effort to try and encourage more people to come up to the, to the mic as well. Um, the IGF has been listening to all sorts of comments and suggestions for improvements going way back to the CSTD effort um, for working a working group effort on improvements to the IGF, to the taking stock sessions we hold at each one of the IGFs, to community surveys, to a retreat that DESA organized in 2016. And we've been actively trying to implement a lot of those improvements. So best practice forums um, is one. The, 
the um, key messages that we started putting out at the Swiss IGF uh, two years ago. Um, significant efforts this year to improve our reporting efforts. Um, so we're, we're really trying to do a lot. And what we need is more ideas and more support. And that support is participation. And frankly, <laughs> since there's a, not a long list of the mic, we need more financial support. Um, it's no secret that um, we're actually getting funding at about 40% of what was budgeted. That directly impacts the level of staff we can put in the secretariat. And frankly, we are running them hard. <laughs> Um, and, and that is the biggest blocker to our making some of the progress and improvements we've all talked about. We are already piloting various things for different types of recommendations and different documents. But we need more support, participation and financial. So again, I, well, at least I got some people up at the, <laughs> the mic here. So let me go to Tamea and then we'll go over to the mic on the end and again encourage anybody who's participating online to, um, to come in as well. Tamea, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, my name is Timiel Schütte. I work for the International Chamber of Commerce, the World Business Organization, um, representing 45 million businesses. ICC has been following the work of the panel since its in inception. Sorry, there's. Um, and we welcome the opportunity to continue to engage uh, with the work of the um, panel and the multi-stakeholder community, uh, including the um, report's recommendations on the governance approaches. Um, in our view, a governance model fit to promote um, this culture of cooperation that we've been talking about today um, needs to be multi-stakeholder, bottom-up, and transparent. And we think that the IGF plus model, as described in the panel's report, is the perfect embodiment of such a governance model. Um, we are viewing this opportunity to raise the IGF's profile, strengthen the IGF institution, and build on the past years to, of the good work done at the IGF to communicate what has happened here, um, the results and the outputs that are in the archives. Um, a conscious effort is needed to increase awareness of the IGF um, and it needs to occur through all resources available to better market um, the existing outputs. In the, in the past, the IGF has benefited from high-level representation of a special advisor to the UN Secretary General um, and that facilitated advocacy and diplomacy and served as an important ambassador for the IGF. A suitable candidate from the community of experienced and insightful stakeholders should be sought for that position. Other alternatives to increase visibility of the IGF um, should be explored, including um, oversight of the IGF by the Office of the Secretary General. Um, the IGF is already producing tremendous amount of output, um, including textual, but also the multi-stakeholder dialogues themselves um, that are valuable outputs. Policymakers can gather many insights from the exchanges of information and experiences on internet policy issues that take place here. Capturing, promoting these exchanges successfully could increase their reach beyond the participation in sessions of the IGF. And we see the cooperation accelerator and the policy incubator um, as potential retainers of this brainstorming activity, sharing best practices and other informal aspects that we have um, to come to value from IGF in the past 14 years. I would like to also echo the comments from our colleagues from Denmark and share your comments just now. We need efforts to expand and strengthen the financial foundation of the IGF. This will be vital um, to enable the forum to expand its existing mechanisms to fulfill the functions that are required by such a comprehensive global governance framework that was described in the IGF Plus model in the report. So thank you. I'm sorry to go over time, but I hope to work with you in getting all these goals off the ground. Thank you, Tamea. Wolfgang, you have the uh, floor. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm a commissioner in the Global Commission on Stability in Cyberspace. And I was, like Raoul, a member of the UN Working Group on Internet Governance, which created the idea to have an Internet Governance Forum. 
uh, it was 15 years ago, and I remember the discussions we had uh, with the governments in the WIGIC, uh, because governments wanted to have a decision-making body. And the argument of the civil society and academic representatives in the WIGIC was, before you take decisions, you have to understand the complexity of the issue. That's why before decisions are taken, you should have a broad discussion forum. And this was the starting point for the IGF. 15 years ago, there were only a limited number of bodies which had the decision-making capacity with regard to the Internet. This has changed now. We have now more than half a dozen, or so nearly one dozen, intergovernmental bodies which have decision-making capacity dealing with Internet uh, issues. In the field of security, it's the GTE, the open-ended working group, the group dealing with uh, uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems. In the field of economy, we have the uh, negotiations in the World Trade Organizations. Uh, we have the Human Rights Council, now the third committee in the UN General Assembly adopted or created a new intergovernmental body for cybercrime. But what I see is that we have now a, a gap, a missing link between the discussion which takes place here and the decision-making bodies, which are more or less, as some people have already said in the discussion, are sitting in their silos. And uh, in so far, I'm very happy with the IGF Plus proposals and in particular with the Cooperation Accelerator, because what could be introduced is better linkage uh, between the discussion platform as the IGF and the decision-taking platforms in the various intergovernmental bodies. So why not to send the messages from the IGF directly to these negotiation bodies and then to invite the uh, chairs of the negotiation bodies to report back to the IGF so that their outcome from the negotiations goes through a discussion process in a multi-stakeholder environment. This would help them to produce more sustainable results and would really close the gap between discussion and decision making. That means the cooperation accelerator in my eyes would be like a distribution mechanism which would then uh, the IG, would be the IGF plus. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. We'll continue going back and forth. I really would ask people to keep their comment to two and a half minutes. Um, if they start running on, we'll have to shorten it to one and a half minutes and then one minute so we can make sure we get uh, everybody's comments in. Vittorio, you have the floor. Hi, thank you. Vittorio Bertola from Open Exchange, and I was also one of the people in the working group on internet governance 15 years ago that came up with the IGF idea. So, of course, now the question is, uh, the, has this multi-stakeholder model been successful? And honestly, I think it's been partly successful, but mostly not. Because uh, what we perhaps did not imagine in the beginning, but what we see now is that uh, the, the lack, basically, of uh, regulation has allowed some very big companies concentrated in a single part or in a few parts of the globe to take over the internet, basically, and uh, impose changes that uh, are usually not discussed or agreed with, with anyone, uh, not in a multi-stakeholder setting anyway. So even the encrypted DNS deployment mess, uh, the DNS of HTTPS issue in which I've been involved, which was already mentioned today, is another little example of how the, the, the big tech uh, companies and sometimes also the technical community just go ahead with things that create big policy messes without involving any other stakeholder. So uh, the, the question now is then, I mean, do these proposals actually address the problem? Well, maybe yes, I mean, I think they could make things better, but in the end, uh, I am afraid uh, that, uh, that, that you need something different to be able to keep these very powerful stakeholders uh, well uh, under control, in, not in a negative sense, but in a sense that they should be brought back to doing something which goes in the global public interest and not just in their own business interest. And if I think, especially from a European perspective, the, the only thing through which Europe actually has had an impact over the global internet was the GDPR, so was through regulation. And maybe that's uh, the, the talent of Europe, but I think that uh, regulation is the only thing we are really good at making in Europe. And so I, I'm afraid we will see, and, but I hope we will see more regulation in Europe to, to preserve some kind of 
sovereignty by the European citizens over the internet, at least for the European sphere. So the challenge for the IGF, I think, will be how do we interact with governments that will have a, a bigger role than in the past. And uh, of course, advising these governments to do the right things is a good thing that the IGF, in whatever form it will take, could do. But at the same time, we must not uh, think that uh, this can prevent this new wave of regulation coming over, and I think it will actually make the internet better. Thank you. Thank you, Vittorio. Um, we'll go to Mark Carvel for comment, and then I understand we have um, somebody from the remote hub in Nigeria that wants to take the floor. So we'll, we'll take them, um, Anya, just after Mark. Mark, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Lynn. Mark Carvel, working with UATX, specifically on the consultation with stakeholders on the high-level panel's report. With regard to uh, 5A and 5B, um, the overall consensus amongst the stakeholder respondents was to favour the IGF Plus model. There were questions about uh, the appropriate applicability of the digital commons, global commons uh, approach of the law of the sea. How can you apply that to the fast evolving digital environment, which is throwing up constantly new public policy challenges and so on? So the digital commons one received no expressions of support. With regard to specifics relating to IGF Plus, yes, there was support for, uh, in principle, the cooperation accelerator, very much for the reasons that Wolfgang uh, has, has recounted. Um, but mindful, really, of uh, the IGF straying from its original mandate as a forum for dialogue, which would then uh, you know, trans translate issues for other entities to implement in practice. You know, that model is a very uh, uh, well-proven one, but it needs enhancing, certainly. So uh, the policy incubator, accelerator, and the observatory were welcomed in principle, but need to work out the details and logistics of how you support those in what will essentially be an intercessional uh, uh, structure for the IGF+. Plus. Global help, help desks, Many respondents said, well, there's a lot of sources of advice and information available through existing mechanisms. Uh, was there a risk of creating a new structure of global help desks that would uh, overlap or detract from existing uh, sources of, of advice? So again, need to look at that more carefully. Tech Envoy, as I mentioned earlier, there was uh, support for, and generally the... Uh, thrust of 5B in terms of a holistic approach, system-wide, involving uh, uh, stakeholder communities across the world to, to ensure that underserved communities are effectively represented and their views are fed into processes. I think those are the points I wanted to underline. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was very, very helpful and quite, quite concrete. And we're going to go to the remote hub in Nigeria now. Um, and while we do that, I just want to kind of remind everybody that we have um, national, regional, sub-regional, um, and youth IGF initiatives across the country. They're, we sort of get a new one every day. I think we're at 117 or 118 at the moment. Um, and I think one of the things that we need to think about as we think through a lot of these different mechanisms is what role we can use. They are on the ground, they're multi-stakeholder, they're knowledgeable about not only these issues, they're knowledgeable about their local, local conditions and local needs as well. So, I mean, I would encourage everybody to think in the background about how we can work more closely with a lot of those activities to, to uh, reach our objectives. But Anya, um, how do we pull in the remote hub from Nigeria? Thank you. 
Thank you, Lawrence. Those are some very key points, um, not only in terms of kind of the local local context, but also the need to focus on small businesses who have so much to offer to these discussions and, and hopefully so much to gain as well. We're going to keep going back and forth. So Raul, I think, oh no, sorry, I guess it would be. Wow, well, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Um, I'm representing the Dutch technical community at this point who made possible to write two iterations of the report strengthening cooperation in the IGF which basically is looking to the IGF Plus model. And they come up with several recommendations that I'd like to reiterate here because it will help the discussion in a, in a practical sense. I think that one of the things that came out of it is that, and this is driven by the IGF community, so this is the IGF community speaking here, is that they're looking for MAG leadership. So actually to, to come up with the, the, the cutting edge topics and make sure that they're debated at the IGF, but not just in the form of a workshop, but in the form of something that is actually distributional and some sort of recommendations come out because we know how bad it is. We don't need to hear that next year. And a way to do the distribution is by making sure that there's some sort of a liaison function between other internet organizations and, and the MAG to actually, actually institutionalize it and make sure that these organizations are always present and bring topics and bring answers back. The other one is to, to start some sort of working groups that actually, at, at the pre, uh, they're prepared, but then worked at, at the IGF in a room and come up with a solution or a recommendation or an action plan and not just have four people discuss a topic on stage, but come up with a so actual solution at the end of the IGF, which is distributable and presentable. The other one that it, it needs to become more solution driven, and that's something else than have, than, than have a law or a regulation, but some, that there's a direction going forward and that we know who to involve to get to that solution so that they can actually be actively uh, presented on and actually brought into the discussion and stakeholders that are not currently usually present at the IGF. And the other one is just to try things out, be imaginative. How can we actually do something different than we ever done before? And in what way would that be inspirational to everybody in the world to actually come to the IGF and be present because you can't afford not to be there? And as a final one, I would like to reiterate what Lynn was saying to everybody. If the IGF is so important as we, says, as we say, then put your money where your mouth is, because otherwise all these things will never happen and we'll be discussing them in 2025, 2025 when this is all over and we get to need a new mandate. But I think by then we need to be able to prove what the added value of the IGF is and that gives us about six IGFs to go from now to actually make happen what we have not been able to do in the past 14 years. So I wish us all luck in getting there. Thank you. Thank you, Wout. Raul? Thank you, Lynn. Um, I envisage an IGF plus that produces a certain kind of outcomes every year. And the outcomes I think the IGF should produce are, are best practices, principles, and general guidelines to address the, the most uh, important challenges that we face. Um, some of those things are already being done, but we need more work, intersectional work, and to advertise better the intersectional work and to help all the stakeholders to engage uh, in, uh, with potential to influence the decisions and the discussions during the intersectional work. So the intersectional work should be something that's, uh, that um, have the participation of much more people. Uh, having said that, the, the, there are things that, that we can control and we, uh, we, we can affect with our decisions and there are things that are happening, a matter of fact. At the same time we are speaking here, there are a group of governments and other stakeholders that are meeting to discuss things like standards for uh, privacy with regard to the governmental services, uh, data protection, uh, cyber security agreements, uh, ethical and artificial intelligence, and some of those groups Neither they don't know about the existence of IGF, and they don't participate. And I have experienced that working for other groups that I have to, to tell them about the IGF because they are not aware of that. But they are doing things that, that uh, lead discussion, they are having discussions that lead to the, to the development of standards that will affect the same issues that we are discussing here. 
So when we discuss about the, the cooperation accelerator, the, this is the, uh, what I think is the, the, the gap that the cooperation accelerator could uh, fill, is, is to, to help to coordinate better and all the pieces, all the groups that are working on different issues to be aligned, to cooperate uh, uh, among them. And in the same sense, the policy incubator, that is, a, a, I think is a, very, is a great idea, uh, but should um, so depart from the basis that, that we cannot tell everybody what they have to, to do, because they are already working. Many people is already working on policies to address uh, several issues. So what we can do is, is in, from this point of view of the, the cross cooperation, is to make all the people to work with uh, all the other people that is involved in a, a certain issue to be sure that they are contemplating all the perspectives and all the point of view at the point of the developing the, the policies. So we cannot just uh, create groups to propose policies on, uh, on certain matters is, is without considering that there are already people that is not linked to the HEF at this moment that is already working on developing policies. We have to work in the incubating policies but coordinating all those uh, different groups. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Raul. Good points. Peter Major. Peter, you have the floor. Thank you, Lynn. Well, just reflecting on what you said about the regional and the national RGFs, I'm proud to uh, report to you that we had our first Hungarian RGF in September. Uh, getting back to the original uh, theme, uh, we had the annual session of the CSCD, I'm a vice chair of the CSCD, uh, and we have touched upon the report on digital cooperation. Uh, we had a very uh, good discussion and I hope that uh, in the annual session which will be held in March, uh, member states will come up with uh, some consensual report on the outcome of the digital cooperation. And hopefully we shall include it in a resolution, draft resolution for the ECOSOC. Now concretely, what I uh, have in mind, uh, basically Wolfgang has mentioned some aspects of uh, the way forward uh, which very much in line, which I have already proposed. Uh, we know that the SDGs do not explicitly mention the technical, uh, uh, the RCTs themselves. However, uh, specialized agencies of the UN have taken up the questions and there are many experts groups in the specialized agencies, not necessarily decision-making ones, uh, as Wolfgang mentioned, but they are coming up with recommendations. So my suggestions as well, uh, the results of this experts group uh, should be included in the discussions of the RGF Plus. And uh, RGF Plus should come up with some kind of recommendations which will be discussed in the CSTD itself. And it can be forwarded to the ECOSOC and through ECOSOC to the General Assembly. And at the end of the day, we may come up with some tangible outputs uh, in forms of recommendations, eventually resolutions. So basically, uh, if we want to keep the whole process within the UN, that's the way I can see, that is the way forward I can see. Thank you. So I, I'll take uh, over f from Lynn uh, and uh, we'll keep the, uh, the order of interventions. Uh, I give the floor to the uh, lady on the main corridor. You have the floor. Can you please identify yourself and the organization you belong to? Okay. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, my name is Deborah Brown. I'm with the Association for Progressive Communications, a civil society organization. I'm not sure if I'm in the right microphone, but I hope this is okay. Um, so firstly, we'd like to congratulate the panel on its work and thank you for your ongoing consultative approach. We found that there are many attractive proposals in the report that would strengthen the IGF's work and capacity to perform its functions. However, we feel that there's a number of questions that are still unanswered. The first is around funding, specifically who would finance the IGF plus model 
In its current form, the IGF is already struggling with its financial support, and with this more robust mandate, we feel that there's more clarity needed on how it will be funded to um, take on this extra mandate. We also had a question about participation, how the IGF Plus model will attract greater participation from governments and from the private sector, that there's um, resources and capacity building for governments might attract some, but won't cer certainly satisfy the needs of a lot of governments who are pushing for a more centralized intergovernmental body. So we'd like to get more of a sense of how the IGF Plus would attract government and private sector participation. Uh, we also had some questions around national and regional IGFs as well as youth IGFs. In recent years, they've expanded in ways that are organic and have helped strengthen and democratize internet governance in many parts of the world, and the IGF Plus model doesn't really address the roles of those initiatives and how they would support the different um, roles foreseen with the IGF Plus model. That said, we are supportive of it. We do feel that that's the best way to continue the IGF's important work over the years and support um, having more conversations around how to improve it. But what we felt was really missing from the report and the IGF model is and would add considerable value is for the IGF to somehow play a connective tissue within the United Nations. That there's a number of digital issues, human rights, governance, security, economic issues that are happening in different parts of the United Nations and that often are out of sync with one another, are happening in silos and sometimes unfortunately contradict one another. So we feel that there's really a need for the United Nations to play that connective tissue and to ensure that there's a more holistic and comprehensive approach. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deborah. Uh, and before turning to, at this point, the last two speakers, uh, uh, I'd like just to recall that we would also like to invite at this point comments on the two other uh, formats that were proposed, the distributed co-governance architecture and digital commons architecture. I, I know some people have already commented, but if you have some specific comment in regard to that, please, uh, this would be the moment to come forward. And in, in regard to IGF Plus, I must confess we were expecting some more uh, inputs uh, as we go through all the comments that were received online. I think some of them were very interesting uh, in regard to the, 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 the modalities that are proposed, the advisory group, for example, there is a comment that uh, in a way it would mirror the existing MAG, so it would be a, another way to pursue with the MAG. The same in regard to cooperation accelerator, I think there is a point, uh, a point was made that actually it would uh, very much do what the best practice forum are doing today, uh, policy incubator and observatory help desk, uh, so the, all, all the elements that are in the proposals, you can, if you, you are invited to comment, the tech envoy, uh, the IGF institutional placement with the executive office, I understand there is uh, general support for that. I don't recall having seen any uh, uh, negative opinion on that, but uh, please feel free to, to come forward. So uh, I'll give the floor to the gentleman on my left, please, you, you have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador, um, and good morning. My name's Chris Buckridge. I work for the regional RIPE NCC, one of the regional internet registries, um, and I apologize if I'm perhaps starting to restate some of the points that have been made earlier, um, but I'll try and be succinct. The RIPE NCC responded to the digital panel's um, report and went into the Eurodig discussion that Mark Cavell has, has talked about, um, and it would be probably no surprise coming from a regional internet registry that one of the points that we emphasised was the need for recognition and incorporation of those regional and national internet governance events that are going on. Um, I think it's been commented that there are more than 110 now active. And certainly as a regional internet registry, we're acutely aware of how diverse the needs and concerns of different stakeholders are across a geography, even one just the service region um, that we cover. Um, so, in thinking then how we incorporate that in, in concrete ways, as we've been asked here today, um, I was actually thinking in terms of what Lynn mentioned before about the work that's done, been done in terms of um, evolution and improvement of the IGF. Uh, you mentioned best practice forums and sort of more reporting. I think the work that's been done to recognise and incorporate NRIs is also something that's been 
done and evolving over the last few years uh, and is very much a work in progress, but it's something that we'd certainly want to acknowledge. And I think that sort of brings me to the point to say that actually a lot of this evolution um, and incorporation of, of these new ideas or ideas that we, we see here is being done by the MAG, and that's, that's a very good thing. It's being done by the institutional parts of the IGF itself. I think the caution I would see is that as we strengthen the institution of the IGF, and particularly as we sort of solidify funding, which is so important, as we embody it maybe a little bit more in sections of the UN structures, we don't lose that control and direction that the MAG and the, the structures of the IGF itself have. We don't incorporate more of a top-down approach in strengthening the ties there, but we maintain that community-driven aspect. So I, I think, I'm not sure that's a really practical advice, but it's something I would really caution and advise that we keep in mind going forward here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, we'll listen to the last four uh, participants on this. Uh, if he, anyone else would like to make an intervention, please indicate it now, otherwise, We'll close the list because as we are approaching the end, we want to give uh, enough time for Mr. Hotchild to, to respond and to provide some more information on the process as it was requested sometime before and also for final comments as we have to stop uh, uh, at 12.30 for security uh, preparations for the opening ceremony. Uh, with this, then, I, uh, uh, I'll give the floor to Paul Blaker. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. My name is Paul Blaker. I'm speaking for the government of the United Kingdom. Um, the UK has, has welcomed the report uh, and welcomed many of its recommendations. Uh, and I'd like to support the comments made by my colleague from France. Uh, we think it's critically important that the follow-up to the report is undertaken in an open and transparent way and in, in an inclusive way so that all stakeholders who wish to participate are able to do so. But I'd like to ask about a different issue, although it's relevant to the high-level panel report. In September last year, the UN Secretary General published a strategy on new technologies and it's really an excellent document. If colleagues in the room have not seen it, I, I recommend it as being a good, worthwhile read. The strategy talks about how the UN can be a trusted venue for all stakeholders to come together in an open and transparent way to discuss technology issues. And it talks about how the UN can be more open to new ideas and new voices. Uh, perhaps the high-level panel could be seen as one example of that, I don't know. But I'd like to ask if perhaps Mr. Hochschild, perhaps in his closing remarks, could say a little bit about how that report is being implemented and how it might support follow-up work to the high-level panel. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I think next will be... Yes, on my far left, please, Madam, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Um, thank you. I'm Ellen Strickland from Internet New Zealand, and um, uh, we certainly um, are very interested in the report and the recommendations and the discussions here today. One of um, the things that I've heard recently, particularly at the Paris Peace Forum, was about this concept of multi-stakeholderism and multilateralism collapsing into each other and the proliferation of processes that are happening in, in collaborative ways, often multi-stakeholder. And I want to talk pragmatically about a process and experience of New Zealand um, that I think can relate and, and contribute to the discussion of these ideas, particularly the IGF+. Plus. Um, we, uh, in May this year, there was a Christchurch call on countering terrorism and violent extremism online um, that the New Zealand government, along with France, um, initiated, which was a unique process engaging governments and uh, companies, as well as stalking a civil society, technical community, 
And um, this happened, for those of you who don't know, because in March there was a terrorist attack in New Zealand which killed 51 New Zealanders from the Muslim community, which was live streamed online and the content was um, modified and um, in coordinated behavior um, distributed in ways that were unprecedented in our understanding of the way of the internet being used. And responding to this as New Zealand, our Prime Minister, um, you know, there was a reflex for domestic regulation, but realized that international action was required on an issue like this, and that companies and, and um, other countries and civil society needed to talk and work together. And so they did it in this way that they put together. And so my question really is, for particularly the cooperation accelerator or the policy incubator and observatory, you know, could functions like this, as we think about how it might happen, what if those that existed in a way that when this happened, um, the New Zealand government and other actors had a place to go where the right people were. And, and so for me, that's thinking, you know, intercessionally, but more than that, like having, being staffed, being in a place to respond quickly to things. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll turn to the gentleman in the main aisle. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me the floor. Uh, I am Mukhabiri um, from uh, Iran uh, academic community. Uh, first of all, I should thank IGF Secretariat, uh, MEG, and government, gov uh, German government for hosting uh, this well, uh, this uh, well organized uh, IGF in Berlin. Uh, we have been hearing the same uh, statement from the member of internet community during past 13 years since the beginning of IGF in 2006. A statement like this. We don't support the internet that is free to fake news that is free to hate speech and online immorality. We are against the internet free to damage the reputation of independent nation. We don't support free access to child pornography, harmful content, online racism, women abuse, dividing nation and online xenophobia. We don't advocate the internet that is open to surveillance, cyber warfare, disinformation campaign, psychological operation, new platform, colonialism, human rights violators, privacy, and forming monopoly. We don't support the internet that is interoperable to cyber intrusion, interference in other countries' internal efforts, cyber attacks, cyber crimes, and data breach. We don't want internet to be secure for criminals and terrorists. We have been hearing such a statement during these years. We don't want internet, uh, existing internet governance model have not sol solved many economic, social, and political problems related to internet during past decades. But we couldn't solve so many problems like monopoly, harm from content, child, porn uh, child pornography, privacy, we don't, we ha uh, why we couldn't move forward so much? The answer is the main root cause of unsolved problems during past two decades is current IG model and policy making mechanism. We have a digital unilateralism. Without solving the main problem of internet policy making, our effort, our effort in IGF and other platforms will, will reach nowhere. The main problems and negative trends that trends the future of global internet and will lead to complete internet fragmentation. Something like militarization of internet, increase in cyber arms race, offensive cyber doctrines by some countries, using internet as a tool for achieving illegitimate geopolitical interest, applying cyber sanctions against other nations, increase the scope and cost of cyber crimes, uh, existing the role of jungle law in internet, especially in dark web, 
and unregulated deep uh, centralization of absolute power in the hands of digital platforms that result in undermining of democracies and national sovereignty and very weak cooperation with digital platform with governments in judicial cases linked to cybercrime and cyber terrorism and using digital right violation cases. Our suggestion to solve this accumulated and unsolved problems are. Could you please uh, conclude? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, enhancing multilateralism in internet, internet governance framework, setting norms and rules on responsible behavior of tech company and digital platform as well as government. Creating mechanism for interaction between the state and platform to dealing with legal jurisdiction, law enforcement and cyber crimes issues under UN, United Nations framework. And uh, we are fully uh, support setting up a new digital United Nations charter. Uh, we all uh, have a digital dream, a new vision for internet. Our vision is at the, at the last one. We hope one day we will collective, with our collective effort, our vision will be achieved. A new, democratic, transparent, ethical, rule-based, trustful, inclusive, and multilateral internet governance model with participation of all parties at service of human goods, peace, human development, and global public interest under UN framework. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I was just told by uh, my fellow uh, participant that there is still an opportunity if you want to send written comments. I think that would be the appropriate way to address your issues, your concerns. Uh, I return to the last uh, intervention. Uh, the gentleman on my left, please, you have the floor, sir. Thank you so much. My name is Nicolas Fiumarelli from Uruguay. I am part of the Youth Ambassadors from ISOC this year. Uh, I, I have some recommendations uh, despite this report. We, prior to the IECF, we have several research about this topic. And we have a recommendation that is uh, from the beginning of the IECF, the idea of having these incomes and outcomes from the national to the regional and then to the global meeting. Uh, the idea is to, to maintain it. Uh, the multi-stakeholder works very well in, in order to have all the, the opinions. So we, we are recommending to digitalize the multi-stakeholder process. I don't know if all people here remember about the Net Mundial meeting when was a collaborative software, when people could emphasize paragraphs and then comment on the paragraphs. So the idea is to maintain these opinions by different categorizations, like stakeholders, topics. And in this way, in this digital process of the multi-stakeholderism, it could be solved uh, and better optim optimized the drafting process. Uh, and it, in, in this case, we could maintain the incomes and outcomes from all the different years and not repeat the, the work and, and maintain like a more ordered way to do the multi-stakeholder process. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and I'm told by Lynn that indeed the same, uh, media, the same resource was used in the preparation of this doc document for this meeting in collecting. So we are trying to incorporate best practices that have been taking place in other fora. So just before turning, and I thank you for your comments, and just before turning to my co-moderator uh, to lead us in the final part of this meeting, uh, I'd like to make uh, three very short comments, uh, and I want again to make a disclaimer that I'm not speaking on behalf of the government of Brazil. I am uh, here on my personal capacity, but I, as I told you, in the last eight years, I have been following processes, uh, have been involved with the Wizards Plus 10 document. Uh, I was proud to be part of the team that organized Net Mundial and also IGF in João Pessoa back in 2015, and so on and so forth. So I, 
uh, I will allow myself to make a few comments, if I may. First of all, uh, I think we should not lose sight of the achievements that were being introduced in the IGF in the last few years. I think as we move to another phase, IGF plus, uh, I think in some papers I read things saying, well, nothing has been done yet. That's not true. Uh, we took upon ourselves, for example, in Brazil, we launched the first version of these document policy options for to connect in the next billion online. I think maybe the name has slightly changed since then, but the idea is to have a compendium of best practices for that will be serve as a tool for, for uh, policy makers, for uh, people that are working around connectivity issues, and this has proved to be a useful resource. And also, if we think about the outputs coming from the Best Practice Forum and other discussions taking place here, I was uh, very impressed to see in one of the comments coming from, I think, the uh, business organization from the United States, and they provide some examples actually examples in which companies uh, benefited from the IGF. Amazon, Microsoft, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, providing very concrete examples of discussions here that were then fed into their uh, process. So I, I think we should be proud of what we have been doing. Uh, of course, we, there is room to improve, to have more visibility, I think, by moving to this IGF Plus and having the support of the Secretary General, it's very important. But let's not, uh, we do not need to, to diminish the work that has been done so far. The second comment is regarding the financial sustainability. Uh, it has been said a lot about uh, th there needs to be more funding and I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, however, uh, we should not lose sight that the, uh, it's, I would say being a diplomat, having served at the UN and so on and so forth, I don't think it's realistic to think that the United Nations will allocate funds for this. For the reason that the United Nations is not an entity detached from, from the membership. The United Nations will do what the members decide. Uh, I, I was serving at the second committee there and one of our fears, and <laughs> we were always a bit uh, uh, nervous when there was uh, what we call the PBI, public. <laughs> the program budget implication, because we knew that maybe what we were proposing there would not fly, because it would be channeled to a committee, and, and the, the overall uh, situation, we, we know uh, there's a lot of strain on the uh, stress on the United Nations as such, because not only the development issues, but also peace operations and so on and so forth, there is a huge, huge uh, list of issues that must be funded by the UN and uh, uh, of course that depends on the involvement of countries, advocacy of countries and if we are talking about a process in which uh, rec it is recognized countries are not here, uh, it's not a, a forum in which we have substantive and robust involvement, it's not realistic to think that back in New York there will be uh, a decision to fund this. I think the, the support from the Secretary General, again, is very important. It's very important to have the Secretary General on board, uh, to be a champion for this. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, it's up to the membership to make a decision. And uh, you, you will excuse me, I, I could not say this before. When I, and I, I asked my colleague, my successor, not to put that in his report, <laughs> because I'm speaking uh, on a very personal basis and, uh, and being even blunt on some aspects. Also in regard to financial sustainability, uh, governments are not in the business of making money, but other people in this uh, room are, and they have been doing a lot of money. They have been thriving because of the internet. So I think when someone says, let's put the mouth, let's put the money where the mouth is, I think that would, should also be taken into perspective that some participants have more resources than others. And they could, if they believe in this process, they could come forward with very significant, significant resources that would be without reach of governments anyway. And I'm, I'm saying this because I really believe in what we've been doing here. I think it's worthwhile. And I think it, we should, uh, everyone should come forward with its uh, 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 resource, its contribution. It's unrealistic to think that civil society can contribute, even the technical, but the private sector might have uh, uh, motivation to contribute. 
And the, the final point, and I, I'm sorry, I think I'm abusing my <laughs> co-moderate. You, you'll never ask me again to come here after that. But I, I'd like to say, and having been in Net Mundial, uh, with Plus 10, uh, CSTD, and so many other forums, uh, I, I, my basic uh, uh, thought about the, the kind of problems we face in IGF, especially making it's uh, uh, meaningful, its outcomes meaningful from the perspective of people that are outside the room and thinking about, the, in the case of governments in particular, because government, of course, is the, the, the part of this uh, group that I know better. I, when we were preparing at Mundial, we made a point to respect fully the culture and the organization of each stakeholder group. Uh, in scoping the meeting, in uh, uh, allowing the groups to select their representatives, uh, so we allow the groups to do that. And I think we did not do this in relation to governments because if we had done this, uh, certainly maybe this year we could have something involving governments because there is a, uh, we need a lot of time to mature this and to go through the groups and so on and so forth. We didn't have time, so we pushed a little bit the governments, but. Uh, my point is that maybe the mistake we made is that at the end of Net Mundial we didn't go, we didn't make the same way back and consult the groups on the outcome of Net Mundial. Because uh, if you recall, at the end of Net Mundial, a very important group of countries came forward and they say we reject Net Mundial outcomes. Uh, and I know that even with, within other stakeholder groups, there were some doubts, even though there is a very strong recognition of the uniqueness of Net Mundial, of the very important contribution made, there are shortcomings. I think today, if thinking back, that if we had taken the outcome of Net Mundial and fed into the UN process, uh, this is the appropriate way to engage countries. We should have tabled it as a draft resolution at second committee and have a discussion on that. Usually at second committee, the G77 is the one that tables, but in this case, I think easily that could be tabled by G77 together with the European Union. And so we'll have a very strong support. Of course, the final document would be something slightly different. You, you would insert, if appropriate, here as necessary there. But I think the content, the, I, I discussed with people that were Net Mundial, they were not much, very much against the content, but against the process. So I think there, and this should have been done by all stakeholders, because even if there would be maybe a final round of refining the uh, uh, unified document on the basis of the contributions coming, that would give a very solid uh, basis for the work forward. So I'm saying this because when I see some proposals that IGF Plus could even engage in normative work or it is unrealistic to think that anything coming from this context would be taken up by governments uh, without any further work. And the, from the perspective of governments, I would say the appropriate way would be to channel it through the, the second committee and, and have it... Uh, Digest it there, and you'll be surprised. Good things come out of these <laughs> uh, processes. IGF is one of them, and so many other examples. And having the Secretary General as a champion for this, I'm sh and, and other countries in the room, I see many countries in the room that would certainly push for that. Certainly, I think that would be a, a way. So I leave it as a personal contribution to this discussion, and apologies for taking so long. Lynn, no, th please. Thank you, Ambassador. I mean, there's a very, very important learnings. I think what we'll do now as we close here is go to uh, USG Hochschild for some uh, closing comments, closing reflections, and then Daniela as well will give you the same opportunity, and then I just have a, a few quick comments as well, and we'll aim to close at 12.30. Look, I'd like uh, to thank you really for your incredible patience throughout this long session um, and for having shared such rich and useful comments on the report. And I, my colleague and I took very careful note and we will do our utmost uh, to build them into the, to the follow-up. I mean, I, I found the comments particularly enriching. I was a little shocked by one of the early comments where it was mentioned at the IETF, there was uh, a stakeholder group that believes that 
uh, abusive imagery of children should be permissible on the internet and malware should be permissible on the internet. I mean, while that sort of extreme version of libertarian views of how digital technology should be used can flourish, we cannot be surprised if countries wish to put up cyber walls. Uh, it's just a viewpoint that many people in the world don't share. So to the extent that the internet is perceived as a tool for globalizing those attitudes, it will encounter more and more barriers. And I'm afraid without qualifying those views, although my personal ones are rather skeptical about such libertarianism, uh, the inevitable consequence will be the fragmentation and splintering of the internet. So I think there needs to be a much broader international effort to protect the public good um, uh, if we want to uphold the global nature of the net. Si je peux répondre à la, la question de la délégué de, de Bénin, je crois que le, le défi de, de, des États membres de, de Afrique, ce n'est pas tellement de construire de nouveaux modèles, mais c'est plutôt d'avoir de, de, la, la coopération internationale pour construire l'infrastructure, soit par satellite, soit souterrain, pour expander um, l'accès au Internet. Et je crois que c'est là où il y a une urgence. Mais cette expansion a aussi la nécessité d'un appui politique. Et c'est là où on a discuté ce modèle de, de, de help desks uh, régionaux. Um, I'd like to thank the, the many expressions of support. Uh, Switzerland and suggestions for further improvements, Switzerland, Denmark, Wolfgang, Raoul and others on how to make an IGF plus most, um, most effective. I think the idea of the IGF being a connecting tissue for the fragmented and rather low profile efforts that are going on in the UN is a very good one. But I fully share the point many made about the need for in, in, in more resources. Um, uh, as the ambassador pointed out, uh, the resource uh, situation of the UN is not ideal, um, but the many countries that have expressed support for an IGF plus, if they brought the resources to bear around their conviction, behind their conviction that that is the best model, and if we could also raise resources from the private sector, uh, I think that would be good. And I think the idea that Raoul and to some extent the ambassador expressed of using the IGF, not just as a discussion forum, but also to propose standards, to propose um, normative frameworks that could be adopted by other normative bodies, including uh, the UN, is a good model that is worthy of further consideration. Si je peux répondre aux questions du, du distingué délégué de la France, Je crois qu'il y a un malentendu, il n'y a aucune intention de manque de transparence dans le suivi des recommandations euh, du panel. Moi, je suis complètement euh, à disposition de votre délégation à New York pour répondre à toutes les questions. Je suis maintenant ici complètement à votre disposition pour répondre à toutes vos euh, questions en ce qui concerne le suivi. Si on n'a pas encore publié le, le, le composant, la, la composition de, de la table ronde pour faire le suivi, c'est pa parce qu'on est toujours en discussion avec le concerné. Um, on a pris um, les, les propositions pour composer ce groupe de la réaction qu'on a reçue de la um, son, plus ou moins sans réponse qu'on a reçue de tout le monde au rapport. Donc, euh, c'est à base de, 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 de initiatives de différents groupes qu'on a composé euh, ce groupe. Uh, the British made the same point about an apparent lack of uh, uh, transparency in the formation of these, these groups. So, I'd just like to, to emphasize that um, I am happy to set aside time on Friday morning 
in particular for the French and British delegation, but for anybody else who wants to join, to, to give them a detailed briefing on the composition of these groups. And I'm happy literally to bore you for hours, if you wish, on exactly uh, how we came up with the composition uh, of, of those groups. Um, and if we haven't, you know, uh, described every step of the composition of these groups blow by blow, um, it's because we thought it would be um, more respectful of your time to do that when we were further advanced. But we're always at your disposal for responding to your questions or anybody others. And of course, we would love to have UK and France support active support, active contribution in the follow-up to the high-level panel. That would be extremely welcome and much needed. And we're very grateful for the many other countries who've already pledged and contributed um, support. Um, in terms of the global help structures, uh, regional desks, there was a question about that. Of course, the idea is not to duplicate existing structures, but to build on them. I've heard different um, we, we now have about half of humankind connected to the internet. Incidentally, it's about half of mankind and about 10% less women. And in fact, rates of connecting women are going backwards, not forwards. That's a little bit alarming uh, in this um, day and age. Everybody, I don't think there's any disagreement, that connecting the second half of humanity will be a much bigger challenge than connecting the first half. The first half are the pose people for whom it has been most profitable to access, largely people in Western countries, largely people in urban centers. In the 47 least developed countries, as I said before, connectivity is under 20%. I've heard different calculations of the cost and the time it will take to connect the last half of humanity. The lowest cost estimates I've heard is about $450 billion. The lowest time estimates I've heard at a current pace are about 15 or 20 years. So yes, we can just go with existing uh, initiatives and existing efforts, and we will end up with a much more greater digital divide and a much more inequality with all that implies. Or we can scale up. We can scale up existing initiatives. We can coordinate them better, and we can try and speed up, as the report proposes, connectivity to achieve it in 10 years. I think we should try and speed the process up. And I think it's in that spirit that the recommendations um, were made. The fi final question from the UK on the ST strategy on new technologies. Thank you for your, for your kind words. It was actually meant as an internal uh, strategy, but in a spirit of transparency, it, we published it um, openly. Um, it has um, a number um, of pillars. Uh, the main one is that the UN itself grows more technically wise, um, both with a view to understanding the implications of technology on our mandates. What are the implications of new technologies for human rights? What are the implications of new technologies for peace and security, for sustainable development? So just understanding what these revolutionary changes are doing to our traditional mandates. A second layer of that education process is seeing how we can employ these new technologies better in our own work. And the Secretary General has periodically now, every six months or so, undertaken surveys, innovation surveys within the UN system to see how rapidly um, different parts of the UN system are adopting new technologies in order to deliver better on their mandates. And the outcome has been rather uneven, but the effort to evaluate, uh, I think, has certainly uh, risen, raised the profile 
um, and made it of greater importance for all parts of the UN to study hard how they can improve their work benefiting from new technologies, digital and others. Um, a second strand of the new strategy was advocacy for international cooperation. And of course, the high-level panel was a key part of that, and the follow-up is a key part of that. Um, but there are many other um, initiatives, um, also in the normative field, which is part of the, the, the report. And I'd highlight um, under the first committee, which is the committee that deals with uh, arms control. Um, and there, there are two initiatives that looking at new technologies uh, through the lens of threats to international peace and security. One, uh, um, an open-ended working group, and another, um, an expert group building on uh, a series of expert groups that have happened over a number of years. And they're looking particularly uh, at the norms that should govern um, uh, the use of um, information technologies uh, in the context of threats to international peace and security. So both on the international cooperation side and on the normative side, the other pillars of the, of the um, strategy, uh, there's been a series of initiatives. And finally, um, the, uh, one of the main recommendations is we should step up our support uh, to member states um, in both in guiding them um, where they seek our guidance on the impact that new technologies could have on their development processes, on their economies, on their political and human rights process, processes, um, and where, um, where required or where sought after also providing support. Um, and I think the UN, different parts of the UN system, of course some parts of the UN system, notably ITU and others, have, have had that as their mandate for a very long time. Uh, and other parts of the UN system within their mandates are stepping up efforts to build the capacity to support those member states who wish it. So I think overall um, we've done pretty well on the implementation of the strategy. We're drafting a new version which will highlight outstanding tasks and will be kept um, under review by the Secretary General for whom uh, making the UN uh, um, better understanding of new technologies and putting it in a position to better support uh, peoples and countries who require our support in dealing with the massive transformations that these technologies imply, for him it remains uh, a great priority and we'll continue to do our best to support him. And once again, thank you for your very enriching uh, comments and also for your patience uh, with my many words. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri Hashtag. Daniela, you have the floor. Thank you, Lynn. I'll be brief so that we can then end on time because this room will then be prepared for the opening ceremony. Thank you all for your comments and ideas. Uh, I take them with me. I have learned a lot. And I especially liked the picture of the IGF being the foundation of the future internet governance. I think we should build on that. A lot of comments have been made supporting the idea of an IGF plus, and I think indeed maybe we should build a sort of a new house, IGF as the foundation and then a new IGF plus. And we should discuss in detail, I think, in the following weeks and months what that shall be then in detail. I heard the call for more political engagement and technical discussions. I take that with me because I agree completely with Fabrizio Hochschild um, that it should be, I mean, no discussion about the fact that the rule of law has also be applicable on the internet and not only in, in the non-digital world. Uh, so we will have to make sure that this is the case. Um, there was a lot of call for strengthening the financial resources. And I'm, I'm glad to say that um, Minister Altmaier announced yesterday that Germany will support the IGF with $1 million. And um, of course, we would be happy to see others to become donors as well. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, coming back to Wolfgang Kleinwächter, who mentioned um, that we will have to fill the gap between the IGF and decision-making bodies, I think he's completely right, and uh, I believe that it would be helpful if we could come out with more tangible outcomes, like, for example, recommendations, I think that would help to fill that gap. Then you also asked for more participation. Um, I think that's also crucial, um, and I think that should indeed also be done um, in between of the IGF for, uh, sessions, so the intersessional work, I think, could be crucial. As Germany has been nominated as a so-called champion, I would call it rather a moderator for the roundtable process that um, will start after the IGF. Um, I can only reiterate what I said in, in the beginning. Um, we will be as inclusive as possible. So everybody is really invited. Please come up to us. Everyone who would like to participate in that roundtable, of course, is invited. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. I just have a couple of quick comments as well and then some thanks. I do have one public service announcement though. Having spent years tracking the IETF, I would suspect without knowing any of the details that the IETF's position was that you shouldn't encode policy in technology, particularly when the body that is encoding technology doesn't understand the policy and isn't responsible for setting policy. So before that becomes a poster example for you know people not hearing and not listening, um, I really would like people to go away and get some more information because I suspect it was just respecting the boundaries. The IETF is not a policy-making body and they have always tried to refrain from embedding political decisions in technology. And again, I've just seen those discussions become poster childs for very unhelpful discussions. Um, I just I really appreciate everybody's participation here and of course all the participation online and the participation of the panelists as well. You know, internet governance in the IGF has always been about evolution and evolving in, in response to needs. There have been many changes over the years with respect to IGF, um, and a lot this year with the support of the German government, of course, because for years we have asked for increased participation from private sector governments and policymakers, and Germany stepped up hugely this year. We had the parliamentarians' um, set of activities over the course of the week, fully engaged in the IGF activities, not a separate activity. We had the high level reinstatement of the high level leaders meetings yesterday, which again was open and fully multi-stakeholder. And then we also have the, um, the funds to support participation from developing countries. So those were all huge efforts. Um, the MAG has actually taken great um, efforts this past year to, to hear some of the, the um, suggestions for improvements with respect to more focused agenda. Um, more um, focus on policy questions and what is it we're trying to get out of every session and trying to improve the reporting there. The, the MAG has had three physical three-day meetings and two two-hour meetings since December every other week. So it's a tremendous load and I don't know how we can get any more out of the MAG to implement some of the other improvements we're talking about, whether it's IGF Plus or a new foundation for the IGF, requires Again, more funding, more participation. The, I don't know the exact numbers, and there have obviously been some recent donations, but the fund, the IGF Trust Fund supports the Secretariat. They're probably running at about just over a million dollars a year to support it, and that doesn't support only the Secretariat and the MAG. It supports um, travel for developing country participants to participate in the MAG and to participate in this meeting. So you can just imagine that it doesn't go very far. So we're not about trying to be a broken record about finance, but there's so much good that can come out of all these sessions and all these meetings if we had some additional support and specifically additional support to the trust fund to support the activities of the, of the secretariat. Um, we've been fortunate this year that DESA has really stepped up and put some additional resources in to support a lot of those activities. And honestly, without them, we wouldn't have made some of the strides we've actually made here in, in terms of some of the um, online activities and, and the reporting activities. Um, so I will stop there. I want to thank the um, interpreters, the scribes, um, the um, repartors as well. We will be producing some key messages within the next, I'm told, 24 hours <laughs> at the extreme side, um, and then a fuller report within the next week or so to actually capture some of this. And equally, I'm sure that the incoming MAG and the incoming MAG chair 
is, are paying attention to all of these comments and will find a way to increase the processes and increase the engagement with the community as we actually continue some of the next stages of this um, increased uh, digital cooperation. So please go to the survey, fill out any thoughts or comments, and, and um, appreciate everybody staying here today. So thank you. And we do need to leave the room um, quickly so that we can get the room set up for the, the panel later. So if everybody could just exit to lunch, which is not a bad idea anyway, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you.